Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links will be found down below. Also, if you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or you're one of the lurkers in the back and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help out the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from those ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Right before the first story, an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listing discretion is advised. So, I have contemplated telling this forever because it sounds so not real, but I've decided to share it now. When I was in high school, I worked at the local Pizza Hut, and I was a closing server. So, after closing down the salad bar and mopping, I got out of there pretty late. I had this ritual of texting my dad when I was almost done to let him know I was almost home, but mostly it was to test and see if him and mom were still awake or not. If they weren't, I would take the long way home on the old country roads. I lived on a dog breeding farm 20 minutes outside of town and I would smoke a joint or two and jam out. One particular night, I decided to do this, and I was riding along a back road about three to four minutes from my house. This is a road I know very well. My bus took this road my whole childhood. One thing to note about my area is I live in the deep woods of East Texas, so most people who own property put their houses about one-fourth to a half of a mile back onto their property and keep their exposed woods as basically a natural fence and defense. So, while you can see a lot of driveways and mailboxes, you can see almost no houses, just woods with chunks taken out. As I'm driving, I come upon a toolbox, like the ones that sit up in the back of work trucks, smack dab in the middle of the tiny dirt road. I pull up to it and stop and open my door, stepping out but not away from my car, as I take in my obstacle, I realize my headlights are not the only light on the road. There are headlights, small ones, coming up a driveway that was parallel to the toolbox. I sit back down in my car and close my door till only a crack is open, so that in a moment's notice I can close it and go off into the grass and get the hell out of there. A small riding wheel lawnmower comes out from the trees and riding it, is a man in a full clown suit and mask with a shotgun laid across his lap. He turns and looks directly through my windscreen and into my eyes and brings the shotgun up out of his lap. Now, I'm a country boy through and through. I can smell when I'm somewhere. I'm not wanted. So before he even got the butt of that thing to his shoulder, my car was in drive and in the side ditch of the road. I got out of there threw my joint out, went home, crawled into bed, and never spoke about it again. I don't know what that guy was doing, seeing as this was probably 2018-19, so after the killer clown craze. Whether it was a dumb kid or some crazy backwoods man, Mr. Clown, I hope we never meet again. I grew up in a small Southern California town known for its orange groves from days gone by. All those groves have been replaced by housing developments and shopping centers now. But there was still quite a few around when I was growing up in the 90s. My friend Johnny and I used to get into all kinds of trouble back then. We were just general miscreants, but there was one time I truly believe we almost became victims of a child predator. If anyone that's listening to this grew up in the 90s, you know that it was a different era. We'd be out all times of the day and our parents would have no idea where we were. 
there were lots of kidnappings back then. I can remember multiple times that I was offered candy or asked by some creep to help him find his cat. I also said I'd go check with my mom, and by the time she'd get outside, ready to whoop some ass, he'd be gone. So anyway, Johnny and I were up to no good one day after school. We were traipsking around the orange grove that bordered his street. We started pulling these little metal damn things off the irrigation channels and tossing them wantonly. All of a sudden, we heard a sharp whistle and both looked up to see this man about 25 feet away from us, wagging his finger and going, uh, uh, uh. But his reaction was not at all proportional to the property damage we were causing. He clearly didn't own or work in the grove because instead of screaming at us at the top of his lungs, he had a grin from ear to ear. I can still see his face in my mind, even after all these years later, and it still gives me chills. Johnny and I stood there for a second watching this guy. Then we looked at each other and Johnny looked back towards the guy and shouted, RUN! I look over and the guy is in an all-out sprint towards us. Despite the physical exertion he was putting into his sprint, the grin was still there. Johnny and I ran harder and faster than we ever had before. We made it out of the grove and back to his house before noticing the guy wasn't behind us anymore. We quickly forgot about it because Johnny's family had just gotten a Nintendo 64 and we started playing Mario. I can't remember if it was the next day or a week, but sometime after this happened, we were with his mom getting donuts, and we saw a wanted poster with a sketch of a man that looked awfully similar to the guy who chased us. He was wanted for trying to kidnap a boy outside of a school. Johnny and I looked at each other and seemingly telepathically agreed to never say a word. I don't know why we never spoke up. Maybe because we were at that age where we'd be relentlessly bullied by homophobes because of the more possibility that we could have been sexually assaulted, but we never did speak of it again. As I'm typing this, I'm considering reaching out to him to see if he remembers and if it aligns with my memory of the incident. There are so many different things that happened in my childhood in the 90s that could have easily ended with me dead. Somehow I'm still here and I have my own family now. I trust no one because of incidents like that. I always have my head on a swivel. So, to the dude who likes to sexually assault children that chased me and Johnny in that orange grove that day, let's never meet again. Hello, my name is Anastasia. And a few days ago, something happened that makes me sick. We moved into an East Coast town about a year ago to be closer to family. So close, in fact, that my aunt, her wife, and my cousins are only a 10-minute walk from my house. Granted, we are very spaced out and borderline rural despite living about 15 minutes from the outskirts of a big city. I was walking my two little dash hounds back home from my aunt's house. My mom hates it when I'm alone the majority of the day, so I spend time at their house, and I was genuinely enjoying my time. It was cold but quiet and oddly beautiful. I got home, fed my pups and two birds, and FaceTimed a friend. I was talking with them and doing chores and was adamantly being loud and giggly when taking out the trash to the cans on the side of the house. I get back inside and lay down in bed still chatting when my bird starts calling at something. Now, anyone who has owned a parrot knows that they have distinct noises for certain moments. She has been in my family for 76 years and with me my whole life. So I know the sound of alarm versus intrigue. I brush it off as her seeing herself in the window reflection and go back to talking to my friend. I get up to go get some water and my back is to the sliding glass door. Thankfully, it was locked, and my friend has the wind knocked out of him. I'm confused and think he's hurt. He tells me, Ugh, nasty. Go back to your room now. 
I scoff, but then I see it in my camera view. There is a man with his face and hands pressed up against the glass door. He's a middle-aged white guy in a gray pullover and dark pants and a huge grin on his face. My friend, ever the best in panic situations, tells me, don't look at him, just go to your room. I was shaking so hard. I'm blubbering and decide to lock me and my dogs in my closet. My parrot is still going crazy. English isn't my first language and it's bad when I'm shocked. So I revert back to my native language, which he doesn't know. Luckily, my friend knows to take charge and he tells me he'll be over in 10 and he calls the police. I'm thinking I can run into my mom's room and find the gun. So if the guy comes in the house, I can blow a quarter size hole right through his chest. I'm debating getting up when I hear tapping on my window. It's slow and intentionally creepy and my stupid dogs start barking. I'm ready to accept my death. I am a teenage girl, home alone, and I'm about to die. Wait a minute. My aunt should be about to leave for work, I think. I shoot her a quick text. The tapping has stopped, and I think it's over when I realize something that makes my balls shoot up into my chest. I left the front door unlocked when I took out the trash. This keeps getting worse, and I beg my friend to hurry. The tapping, thankfully, returns to my window, and I can only close my eyes and hope that someone gets here fast. It feels like an eternity, crying to another teen who's breaking multiple traffic laws. Never before have I been grateful to hear another man's voice yelling outside my house at 1 a.m. It was my God-sent neighbor. Apparently, his pregnant wife was having bad nausea and went out on the deck and where it's situated, you can see my whole backyard. She got a bad feeling after seeing the unfamiliar man approach my door and waking her husband to check it out. I'll thank God every day for her, because I think she saved my life. I let my neighbors into my house, and my aunt comes about four minutes later, packing major heat. My friend, not long after her, I go from home alone to an impromptu house party of concerned people. The police came like 10 minutes later, like they didn't just take 30 minutes to arrive to the scene. I mean, what the hell? Is that normal? On the bright side, my bird wasn't too alerted by this encounter and went back to eating not five minutes later, and my dogs were just happy to see people. My friend has been staying the nights with me ever since. I'm finding it hard to be home alone, despite the fact that an arrest was made. I'm so thankful that my neighbor had such good instincts and that my aunt and friend were so quick on their feet because this could have been a lot worse. So, man at my window, let's not meet. When I was 19, my parents went out of town and I stayed home. I had every opportunity to go with them, but the idea of spending six hours in the car and then three days in a musty hotel with questionable linen was deeply unappealing to me. I'd stay in the house by myself many times before, and we lived in a fairly safe area, so I felt perfectly comfortable staying with just me and my two dogs, an elderly wiener dog named Logan and a barely out of puppyhood Belgian shepherd named Dante. In fact, I was glad to be able to sit on the couch in front of the good TV instead of huddled on my bed with the little TV with the fucked up screen. The second night my parents were gone, I was sitting in the living room and it was only about 11 o'clock. I had just taken Dante out and had settled back in to continue my Harry Potter marathon when the front door opened. We had a security system that dinged loudly when any door or window was opened, and it always set off a barking fit in Logan. It did this time, and I heard a male voice say, Shut up, Logan, you stupid fucking mutt. It was not a voice I recognized, and I immediately noped the fuck out, bolting out the side door without even grabbing my phone or putting on my shoes. 
Dante followed me out the door, but to my knowledge, Logan never even poked his head out of his crate. I would have been shocked if he had. He was old and cranky. My neighborhood was shaped like a horseshoe, with five houses and a wooded lot in the middle. The house next to mine was occupied by complete assholes. The house next to that was empty, and the house next to it was occupied by a retired cop and the lights were on, and I headed toward it in a dead run, running through cold mud and sticker bushes in nothing more than a nightshirt. Right before I reached the tree line, I looked back toward my house. The front of my house had a row of windows, and I could clearly see a man standing in the dining room. He had a short, dark beard, and I think his hair was pulled back into a ponytail, and he was wearing a dark green hoodie. I made it to the house and pounded on the door and explained to my neighbor what had happened. He immediately went and got his gun and his phone and called the police, making me and Dante stay on the porch with his eldest son, who was probably a little older than me. I was frankly terrified and couldn't stop shaking. Dante was having the time of his life, having made a new friend in the form of the neighbor's son. Dante's was a happy nature. The cops get there fairly quickly, and they and my neighbor did a quick search of the house and found nothing except the front door gaping open and some muddy footprints on the porch that clearly didn't match mine. The cops asked me some questions, but it mostly boiled down to, it's someone you know, he knows your dog. But I know for a fact that that guy wasn't anyone I knew. Neither his voice or his face was familiar. The cops brushed me off, likely just thinking I was some batty chick. However, they did say that they would have a car roll by once or twice during the night. I ended up going back to my house and locking myself in my bedroom, clutching my dad's pistol. To this day, I have no idea who that guy was. He thankfully never came back, and nothing ever came of the police report. Everyone else sort of brushed it off, but I had a hard time. The guy had known my dog's name, so it wasn't like it was random. For a long time after that night, I've had nightmares about the stupid ding the doors made when they open. I'd be half asleep and jolt awake, hearing that stupid sound, even after we had moved out of that house. Despite the fact that nothing really happened, it was hard for me to not imagine what could have happened. At the time, I looked like a fairly petite girl, so my mind always went to the darkest of scenarios. To the guy in the green hoodie who broke into my home, let's never meet again. All right, dear listeners, this next story may be sensitive or disturbing to some. Listening discretion is highly advised. I met my ex online when I was 19. When we began dating, I was shunned from the small Pentecostal church I grew up in my entire life. So naturally, as a 19-year-old, I clung to him because everyone I was allowed to know had cut me out of their life. Why did they cut me off? Well, they believed I was unequally yoked with a non-believer because I was dating a black man with long hair who listened to ACDC. I thought they were judgmental and I was drawn to the outcasts because I felt I understood them. My relationship with him was great for the first two years. I was incredibly inexperienced in his eyes sexually. He made me feel inadequate. The dynamic of our relationship was that he was three and one-third years older than me. He knew more about my life than I did, and that I should listen to his advice on things because he knew better than I did. Around the two-year mark of being together, I noticed he stopped going to bed with me. He was staying up late and doing things on his computer. I later found out he was sending NSFW photos to other women and getting them in return. When I confronted him, he simply said, Well, are you leaving me? And I was heartbroken. Felt I only had him, so I stayed. He explained that he felt he had met the right person at the wrong time. Explaining he felt I was his person, but 
he didn't get to show his wild oats, so to speak. I was devastated because essentially, he told me he wanted to fuck other people. That's when he pressured me into the swinging lifestyle. I started out with meeting other couples. He arranged everything. He dressed me and took photos of me. He spoke as me to other people in order to get play dates. When the play dates would happen, he couldn't get hard, and then he blamed it on me for his insecurities. I felt almost mind-fucked into doing whatever I could to make him happy and satisfied. You might ask me, why didn't I just leave? Well, he convinced my friends and family that he didn't love me or support my decisions in life. He was an elaborate thinker. He had a reason for everything. He knew how to play on my emotions, knowing I cared for him. He spun everything in a way to make me feel he was caring for me and wanted to see me in the third person. I was treated as his property or prized possession. He began controlling how I dressed and started setting up dates with men I didn't know, requesting that I take videos and pictures to share with him later on. I've always been a one-man type of girl. This was so out of my element and I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel I could speak up or he would believe I didn't trust him. I began going on these arranged play dates with men to make him happy. Each time nearly having a panic attack, not knowing the situation I was walking into. One time coming back from a play date, the men had claimed he recorded our session for me, but recorded the wall instead. That was the first time he physically laid hands on me. I learned the coping mechanism of disassociation very quickly. I entered survival mode and made myself into something else to make him happy. And when I was at home, I was just me. Until one evening where he told me he arranged a play date for me while simultaneously he quit his job. I was confused. Why would you just quit your job without discussing with me first? I went on this play date and met a man I would have never touched with a 10-foot pole who was offering me $200 to have sex with me. I was stunned, horrified, and felt like I was living in a dream. He had quit his job, and when I confronted him on arranging a paid exchange for sex with a man who I would have never touched, his response was, it was my turn to provide for us. Rent was due in two weeks, and we had $30 in our bank account. I felt I had no choice. This went on for five months. He put me in lingerie, took pictures of me in any position he could think of, put them on the escort websites with an alias name and a text app to text clients. I never was allowed to keep the money have a say in who I saw, and at the end of every weekend, he would thank me by a nice dinner and keep the rest of the money to fix up his busted 1974 Ferrari. Afterwards, I would lay in bed and just cry myself to sleep. I told him so many times I was not happy doing this, but he told me we needed to pay our bills. He was intimidating, demeaning, and a shell of the man I thought I loved. My last client I ever had was law enforcement. They knew about him because he would stay in the lobby while I met clients. They separated me from him and asked me to tell them what my partner was making me do. I lied to them and told them I was compliant and a willing party because I was taught not to be a snitch or trust law enforcement. I got a misdemeanor charge for prostitution. I left him two weeks later, while he was at his new serving job. I packed all my shit and went home. This was 2014. Since then, I've gotten married and had two beautiful children. But I recently discovered videos of me that he uploaded onto porn sites that have been there since 2014. One of them shows my face in it with over half a million hits. Is it too late to press charges for sex trafficking? 
This was in the state of Virginia. The video of my face on his porn site was a private video with my ex and I. I need it to be removed. I have a career and I have three brothers and I have a husband and children who never need to learn about this. I don't know my rights, but I don't know how to handle this situation because I've avoided it since I escaped that life and now all these feelings are flooding back to me. He has stolen my innocence, made me feel shame for telling my story, lied on my name to everyone we knew to cover himself. He's now married in a different state and has me blocked on all accounts, but I have access to his wife's page. What would you do? And please, if you have any advice, I am all ears. All right, listeners, this next story is also a listing discretion is advised. I wrote this as a warning for anyone else who might be going crazy over this guy right now at the complex. You are not going crazy. Call the police department and demand a report and then follow up. I'm writing this because I firmly believe it is still happening and I want to write a warning. I don't care about sharing location because I've moved on, but it is critical to this story. I've never written a post before this, but if I can save anyone from the years of hell I went through, it's worth it. My grandma moved into an apartment complex called Brampton Moors in Cary. You can look up the state. It's a beautiful city, low crime rate, and lots of trails. This is the critical part of the story. My grandma moved in 2017 to a ground level apartment near a trail that connects to the entire Greenway system. It was accessible before. It was the only option. It wasn't soon after, since I live with her, that very strange events began. I noticed at night that I'd hear pine straw rustling round and shadows outside changing. The construction of this place is bad enough that you can hear outside clearly. I didn't think much about it because I thought it was wildlife from the trail and there was a lamppost right near that window where I was staying. Wrong. I used to go on the trail during the day and I always carried self-defense items but I started to feel like my movements from the apartment were being tracked to when I was staying over or not. My grandma's side didn't experience as much because it was further from the trail, but it was darker on her side. One night, she did report someone trying to pop her window. The police dismissed her because of her age. Soon after, it got worse. Every summer night that year, I heard more atypical noises and a shadow of a person. It scared me to death because I was a young adult and I feared the escalation process. I have a sociology degree. I would call the non-emergency line for the PD first, talking as quiet as I could so they could catch this guy. But he'd escape every time on the trail. Maintenance put in metal pieces and jammers on all windows, and my grandma was finally convinced to install a security system on every single entryway because it would not stop. The PD would not do anything until this guy hurt me. Essentially, I had two choices, become nocturnal or beg friends to sleep at their houses to feel safe sleeping. My ex, partner at the time, lived across the street from my grandma's place, and I often stayed the night at this point because I was truly terrified. One night, my ex was taking me back to my grandma's apartment at night, and we saw this guy dressed in all black walking on the sidewalk away from the complexes toward stairs that lead from the sidewalk to the path below around midnight. That is not normal for Carrie at all. Not even in summer. We saw that he pivoted back to the apartment to look into apartments behind bushes. So my ex shined the brights on his car, and I took a very detailed description based on the illumination. 
I was certain I was going to get a visit again that night because this person was in a position to see when I came and went from the apartment. Sure enough, I heard the rustling, the breathing, the pine straw, the trees, and the tapping near the window. I quietly called 911 and also reported the other apartment numbers and buildings he was peering into. I gave them the description, the direction he was probably going to flee in after hearing me on the phone and everything. He fit the description of a previous tenant who stalked women in the complexes before. Carrie PD finally took me seriously on that report the next day because the other women in those apartments caught him looking into their homes as well, through the windows, because there were dark patches and easy access to the greenway. I made a huge fuss and a group of us filed a police report. For privacy reasons, they wouldn't even tell us who it was and that they knew who it was. Therefore, I could never get enough info to defend myself further. The complex installed very bright lamp lights. I bought a taser and slept with a hunting knife near me when I could sleep. But he would still come to my window and I would hear him most nights. I started cursing him out and yelling, telling him that I'd take out all the anger I had at my horrible childhood on his ass and that if he ever dared to go further, I would make sure he'd meet the devil very soon. I got angry to the point where I would yell through the window at this asshole. I called the PD each time, and every time, nothing was done. No fingerprints taken. Nothing. I put up curtains. I tried my best, but this guy continued to terrorize me while I lived with my grandma until I could not take any more, and I left to leave with a different person. This is a key reason I lost a lot of years with my grandma, who recently passed. For those in the area, he's a bald white man who wears a black baseball hat, dark beard, stands around 5'9", wears an all-black shirt, black cargo shorts, and black shoes. He is probably in his late 30s to early 40s now. He hangs around the lake trail that descends into the woods, where the trail goes under the road to enter the park greenway. People say he's a former tenant who was told to stay off the grounds, but the complex doesn't care for the residents. He stalks women on the first floor apartments, and I do fear that something might happen. My grandma most likely wasn't targeted as much as me because I fit the target demographic. I went insane to the point where I had to take Zequil during the day to sleep to make up for night watch and making sure this creep didn't break in and assault me and my grandma. Nobody should ever go through that. I was scared of every shadow I saw, the footsteps I heard, and the breathing. I couldn't go to sleep at all until 4 or 5 a.m. He likes to be active anywhere from past midnight to around 2 to 3 a.m., being his peak hours. He escapes via the greenway into the woods every single time. So many women reported experiencing the same thing and the complex ignoring it and the police also avoiding addressing the issue. This just doesn't happen in Gary, but it will only get worse. And I hope by posting this that I will be wrong. To my stalker that took my sanity, safety, and years with my grandma while her health declined because I felt my life was in danger where I stayed there. Let's not meet because I will absolutely take out my grief on you. You don't scare me anymore. If anything, you should be scared that I caught you in the act and I will always testify to the terrors you caused. You are a sick, twisted person that deserves the uneasy insomnia you inflicted on others, if not worse. I have a story to tell you that happened to me on Sunday, October 29, 2022. My father, for the story, will be Daniel Chuckmuch, 
and I, Joan Truckmunch. I currently live near the Swiss border and reside in France, originally from Grenoble, where my entire family, parents, and sister live. My parents live in their apartment on the outskirts, and my sister lives in Grenoble. After a pleasant weekend with my girlfriend, visiting our families, we return home. After a a one-and-a-half-hour drive, we grab some McDonald's and settle in front of a series. At that moment, I receive a call from an unknown number. It started with 07. At 9 o'clock p.m., Generally, I don't answer unknown numbers, especially at this hour, due to harassment issues in school that left lasting effects. I'm 26, by the way. However, I felt a strange sensation and decided to answer, thinking it might be important. I answer, and after saying, Hello? Someone immediately asks, Are you the son of Daniel Truckmuch? I, of course, answer yes. It didn't surprise me at that moment because my father has been a salesman for 35 years in the same company, and my phone number was his 15 years ago. So I sometimes get calls from very old clients of his. We don't have the same voice, so it didn't surprise me to be asked, are you the son of? After confirming, the person says directly, your father had a car accident. Panic rises in me. I start trembling. My girlfriend is next to me and immediately senses that something is wrong. I was petrified because the tone used by the stranger clearly meant, he is dead. In panic, I ask, where, how, and the crucial question, who are you? They tell me they are a witness to the accident and my father was taken to the hospital. I panic and shout, asking where, where did the accident happen? How? The person says the car flipped. Trembling, I explain to my girlfriend, and he says he wants to call his wife. I hang up immediately. At that moment, I conclude that my mother wasn't with him. For your information, my parents sometimes have significant arguments, and my dad occasionally goes for a drive. My mother has been ill for years and goes to bed at 6 p.m. every day. So, I knew I wouldn't reach her, but I still try. I call my mother, no answer, and I call my sister, who is more sensitive and has a panic attack, screaming on the phone. I tell her to wake mom up immediately because she's not answering the phone. At the same time, my girlfriend calls her mother to ask her to call hospitals around Grenoble to find out where he is. Meanwhile, I call the number again for more information repeating, where did it happen? Where? The person avoids the question and after a few seconds gives me the road number. I shout at him, who knows road numbers? Toward where? What city? What village? He says towards Angers. And then it clicks. I think, wait, I was with my father at 5 p.m. I'm on now. It's impossible for him to have traveled from Grenoble to Angers in four hours. At the same time, my girlfriend, with an incredible reflex, hear me say, Angers? And immediately calls my father on his mobile. My father answers disdainfully, Yes. She says, Daniel, you didn't have an accident? And he laughs and says, (laughs) What? Absolutely not. I'm on my couch watching football. I tell the person on the phone that my father is online. He says, But you're not Matteo Truckmuch? I reply that I have no Matteo in my family and that I am Joan. The man apologizes, but in a way that gave me a chilling feeling, as if he had achieved what he wanted, to see me panic. And I ask him five times how he got my number, and he never answered. He says, sorry for scaring you. I hang up, inform my sister, and calm her down. Late, I exchange messages with him because I didn't understand how he got my number, which is literally nowhere on the internet. He told me that my number was displayed on the first page of Google in a directory. I searched the internet thoroughly with my girlfriend that evening, and it's impossible. 
and the messages were strange. He mentioned a Laurent, even though he clearly said my dad's name. He apologizes for his clumsiness, that he managed to contact his wife, that this person is deceased. After a few days, my sister-in-law, who is a surgeon, told me that it's the firefighters who contact the family, not random people like that, even those involved. Moreover, when there are deaths on the road, there is always a press article or even an obituary that I never found. I tried calling the number a week later for answers, and the number was no longer assigned. Was it a bad joke? Was it someone who wanted to see me panic? How did he get my number? Just writing and remembering this moment still gives me chills. So, for the guy that called me, letting me know my father was dead, thank you for scaring the shit out of all of us. I hope to never meet you again. So, a few years back, sometime in 2015, it was a regular morning and me and my family were at home. My family is very small, the only ones being me, my sister, and my mom. My mom at the time was cooking me and my sister pancakes for breakfast at around 11 a.m. when suddenly we hear the doorbell. Might I mention me and my sister are both disabled and we're both in wheelchairs due to being born with a disability that doesn't allow us to walk or anything of that sort. So, really, we depended on our mom to protect us. Anyways, so we get a ring of the doorbell, but we ignore it since we weren't expecting anyone, and we don't answer the door to solicitors. A few seconds after that, the doorbell rings again, and the three of us didn't really think much of it, but we thought it was a bit weird. So, a few minutes pass, and the doorbell is still ringing. We were all a little scared, and then we suddenly started hearing rustling at the window outside. That's when my mom decided to open it. When my mom opened the door, there was an Asian girl, about in her late teens, attempting to pull the frame of our window off. She had a blue Walmart bag filled with God knows what, but it looked very heavy. So, the girl immediately stops what she's doing, and my mom yells, what the fuck are you doing? My mom yells at the girl, and she backs away from the window. We had noticed a strange black truck parked right in front of our house, and we could see two other people waiting inside it. We live in a small neighborhood, and this truck was not familiar. So the girl backs away a little and says, uh Oh, uh, is Michelle here? My mom says, Who the hell is Michelle? There's no Michelle. Get the fuck away from my house. My mom was swearing a lot because she was scared. It was just us home, and there was no one to protect us. We were all girls too. I was really scared, and my sister was crying while we ate our pancakes. The girl immediately ran off as my mom got louder, and she just kept on asking for Michelle. There was no one who lived in our house named Michelle. The girl ran back to the mysterious black truck, and it immediately sped off. My mom started freaking out, and she called the police. She gave them her description, and they never came to investigate. That day, my mom made an appointment to get us ADT home security. That night, we all slept in her bed, because the room that the Asian girl was trying to take the window off of was me and my sister's bedroom. My mom stayed up all night, walking around the house with her axe. No one tried getting in after that, and the next day we got our home security with cameras and everything. Since then, no one has ever tried breaking in again. After talking to our neighbors about this, we learned that these mysterious intruders were returning. These same people actually robbed our neighbors. They weren't home at the time of the robbery, and they caught it all on their cameras. They stole a few things, then left. I thank God that we were safe, because we didn't know their intentions. Dear Asian kid asking for Michelle, let's not meet, ever.
My story starts in 2014, when I was just 10 years old. I had just made a Gmail account, and it made me feel really grown up and mature. I'm thankful I didn't pick something stupid for the address because I still use it to this day. With my Gmail account, I created a blog on which I posted book reviews and recommendations because I was kind of a nerd when I was younger. I gave all of my classmates the link to my blog, and I knew every single person that engaged on it because their usernames were some variation of their real name. However, one day I received a comment on a post I made from a username that I didn't recognize, Pinkie Pie. They left very normal comments on my posts, and I thought maybe it was one of my classmates with a different username. I didn't think too much of it. Then, about two years later, in 2016, I made a Roblox YouTube channel, which I have since deleted. Cringy, I know. I would record gameplay and post it onto my channel, and I gained a whopping 18 subscribers or something like that. But one of my subscribers, the only one that regularly commented on my videos, was called Pinkie Pie. This kind of freaked me out because I had made a completely new email for this channel and hadn't told anyone about it. Roblox used to be my guilty pleasure, so I kept my channel a secret. I kept on brushing off the Pinkie Pie appearances, commenting on my videos, my blog, my friends' YouTube channels, and even my mom's Facebook. As coincidences until 2019. I was either 14 or 15 and had made my very first Reddit account. This was when I was in my K-pop era. I was a regular on r slash K-pop and made news-like posts about happenings in the K-pop world. One day, I made a post on r slash K-pop like usual, and one of the comments was from another user named Pinkie Pie. The comment read, Ah, of course, it's Korea Boo with the clickbait headline. And nobody questioned it because it was a fairly normal comment that still stayed relevant to what my post was about. I clearly remember that feeling of losing my mind because of this Pinkie Pie person who had been showing up on every single social media account I ever created ever since my first Gmail account. I believed that I reported the Pinkie Pie account and deleted my own Reddit account. I still kept tabs on Pinkie Pie though, and I have the link to the post saved to this very day. Now we jump to 2020, when I was 16 years old and the pandemic had just started. At this time, I was kind of emu and angsty and insecure, as most people are at least once in their lives. I had not made a TikTok account, even though it was all the rage because of literally only one thing, the fear of Pinkie Pie finding me once again. It was at this time I discovered 4chan. 4chan's complete anonymity and my strongest weapon, the Opera browser, and its VPN led me to believe that I was 100% safe and protected. Even if I was on the website that was basically full of the devil's spawn. I posted normal things, sometimes explored the NSFW side of 4chan, and mostly just enjoyed talking to strangers on the internet. One day, I was feeling especially brave and horny. What? I'm a 16-year-old. So I took three to four nudes of myself with a timestamp and posted one of them on slash be slash. I post rose to the top because I had mentioned that I was Asian in the title, which I am. And obviously 4chan went crazy over that. I had lied about my real age and said that I was 18 when I was in fact still underage. I shouldn't have fucking done that. I don't even know what I was thinking. I remember receiving between 400 to 500 replies on my thread, and not all of them were nice. Still, I got a lot of compliments, which really satisfied my ego and made me feel a little better about myself. Then, as I was lurking over my thread, refreshing every two seconds, I saw a comment from somebody named Pinkie Pie. It was another generic, humorous compliment 
but this one did not make me feel admired or appreciated. To be honest, it made me feel sick to my stomach. This was my breaking point. I remember bursting out into tears, deleting that thread immediately, and then going into a paranoid delusional state. I deleted all of my social media accounts, except my Gmail, powered off my phone, shut down my computer, and even disconnected the Wi-Fi. I honestly felt like I was going insane no matter how much I tried to forget about this person. They showed up literally everywhere online. By that time, it had been around six years since Pinkie Pie first showed up. For a couple of years after that, I took a break from every type of social media entirely. I got rid of my Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, YouTube, basically everything. If I wanted to go on a social media site, I would do it without signing in. This gave me a much needed break from Pinkie Pie. I never deleted my Gmail since I use it for everything. What's odd is that while Pinkie Pie had found me on every social media site I use, they have never once directly emailed me. I am sure that they do have my email. They've just chosen not to email me. Finally, we get to 2023 and to present times. Sometime in early January, I decided to make a Reddit account again and mostly just lurk. I posted, commented very little, and I received no comments from Pinkie Pie. I believed the ordeal was finally over. In November, a few days after my 19th birthday, I went to Japan for my cousin's wedding. I decided to make a Reddit post on r slash outfits of my wedding outfit because I really liked it and wanted people to see it. Guess who commented on it? Well, to be honest, I don't know who it was. By the time I read the comment, the account that had written it had already been deleted. But they wrote, How is Japan? Liking it more than name of the city where I live. Name of the state where I live. USA. Once again, I was in hysterics. I was and still am 99% sure that this is Pinkie Pie. Somebody even if it wasn't who I thought it was, had just fucking doxxed me on the internet. I reported the comment, reported the user, and once again deleted my post and deleted my account. All I can do is run. I made a throwaway account to share my story, because I need it off my chest. I haven't told a single soul about this. I feel unsafe all the time and have paranoia-induced hallucinations occasionally, and I cannot explain to anyone why. I swear to the fucking gods if Pinkie Pie comments on this. Hey y'all, this took place in summer of 2022. I just never thought of writing it down because I was so stunned that it actually happened to me. So, every summer in my city, me and my friends like to make small campfires and chill out in secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fee to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute hangout to do. There's this one spot near my house and that's located by a river that's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about are bears, though, because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that, and my house specifically is located right next to mountains and forest. So one particular night at 11 p.m., I decided to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I wanted us to be chilling once they got there. The spot I get to has a two-minute paved walkway. I have to go through and then I have to make a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway is two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge or ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street 
then bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighters, small firewood, small shovel to dig out the pit, etc., etc. I get to the spot, and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during the hot summers. So, I set up the chair and I get to digging the pit, with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden, I hear a loud splash. A splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large like a two-hand sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water even though I'm only feet away from it. I shine my flashlight at the water, and I don't see anything. So I kind of brush it off, thinking I'm just hearing stuff. But, as I kept shoveling a bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I think something is falling from above, because logically, something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above, where some trees are above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make the splash. So, as I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call it out. Hello? No response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately. But there was no bear or signs of anything, for that matter. So I tell myself I'm just hearing things now because I've even seen horror movies before, and now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled. So I shine my light over to the area again, and as I focus my eyes toward the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress because honestly, all, all these things I was to see, I did not expect to see a naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be mid-forties, shaved, not bald, and medium-ish build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all my crap and getting the hell out of there, because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or shoo me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all of my things with me and briskly walk up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I am frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in Crocs, mind you. So I'm hoping that if I had to book it out of there, I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point and a sense of relief starts setting in knowing I made it home safely out of this very scary situation. Now, as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours as if he was primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway he slowly gets up from this distance and starts standing on his feet and positions his body to face me. After setting himself into this new position, the man starts running toward me. I freaking book it. I run as hard as I can down that path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it, but I didn't care because a whole ass naked man was chasing me at 11 p.m. at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second and the man was still running toward me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care, 
I wanted to make it out of this situation alive. I finally made it out of the forest and I run to my car which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get to my car and like a classic horror movie, I fumbled with trying to get my key fob to unlock my door. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead. But I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock my doors and throw my things into the back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, mostly took maybe six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I am fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago waiting to see if the naked man was coming still. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me, and I zoom out of that area as fast as possible. As I drive away, I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place. I get a call on my phone. It was my friends calling me asking if I made it to the spot yet, and all I can say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you. They pull up to my house because, again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story the way that I told it just now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that, and I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dong out. But as we're just talking in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered the naked man. I just yelled at him, Yo, be careful, there's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds, saying, Oh damn, really? I gotta go over the bridge to go home. All I tell him is, Good luck, man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said they would make note of it anyways in case it happens again. Some friends say it's a skinwalker, others say more realistically it's either a homeless or mentally ill or a drunk or high person. One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on the past version of me. Because honestly, if, when, time travel was real, I would totally screw with my younger self like that. So that is the only crazy let's not meet story I have, but damn, is it a story I will never forget. So, to the half-naked man that chased me from my favorite camping spot, I hope I never run into you again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the reformed members of Back to Ashes, Tina Me, Code Stone Wolf, Inner Scare Wifey, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Peace, love, and light to you all.